Hello everyone um, from my side or from our side. My name is Lukas Neuss and I'm here today and, and really pleased to, to be here today and present you the, this year's food panel here at uh, Green Tech Festival. So um, here on stage with me we have a um, tiny but nice um, food tech community, uh, mostly from Berlin, uh, but also elsewhere. And um, yeah, we are really, really happy to be here and um, yeah, dig a little bit deeper into the, the topic and the issue of, um, of the, the food system and how we can change that for the better. Um, I had the honor already last year to, to moderate this, this panel. I think Alexander was here with me also last year and uh, the others are new to the round, but I think that um, where, while last year we kind of um, were a little bit on the surface and uh, introduced the, the, the topic uh, to some extent also to this festival, um, exploring different solutions um, um, and, and uh, how, see how innovation actually takes place already in this market. Uh, I hope that this year we can dig a little bit deeper into it and uh, address a little bit more the, the actual question of scale up and how, how to reach the mass market through um, food tech innovation. So this is why we're here today. Um, thanks that you all made it. And um, first of all, I want to introduce everyone um, and then everybody can maybe follow on and uh, tell a little bit about themselves and how they actually, um, yeah, um, how they actually um, work in this environment and what they do in food tech. First of all, we have um, Christian Poppe from Formo as a, a regular, regulatory director. Um, then we, we have um, Tanja Bogomil from Perfect. And then we have Emma from um, Farmy and uh, Good Bank. And uh, then we have Judith from Planted and Alexander from Vert Asus. Um, maybe, um, ladies first, you see we have a um, evenly distributed panel, which is really, really good. Um, start with the ladies. You did um, maybe want to introduce uh, yourself and tell us a little bit more about Planted for those who don't know the brand already. Yes, super happy to quickly introduce Planted. So we are a food tech startup originally founded around four years ago in Switzerland. We've developed our own technologies in order to transform plant-based proteins into meats that are super delicious and, and also healthy and much more sustainable than animal meat. We've, we're not that startup y anymore, so we have scaled quite a bit over the past four years. We're by now around 250 people. We operate our own production, um, produce around 20 tons per day close to Zurich. We're um, selling our products in around eight European markets. We're market leader in Switzerland and also growing really fast in Germany. So you can get our products at Rewe, Edeka, Deutsche Bahn, HelloFresh, Tim Rauer, if you fancy a Michelin star restaurant, um, or also in the food truck outside. Um, I'm Judith, I'm one of the co-founders. I um, hold a PhD in food process engineering, and I'm responsible for product development, IP, regulatory and quality at Planted. Happy to be here. Hello, hello. Perfect. Hi, everyone. I'm Emma. I'm the founder of Good Bank and of Farmy. Maybe some of you remember Good Bank as a restaurant, restaurant chain, or you have already visited it. Um, we um, opened our first restaurant in 2017, and we were the world's first vertical farm to table restaurant. In the meanwhile, quite a shift has uh, happened. We have uh, fully focused on the retail market. We're now at almost 200 locations, similar like planted at all the big players, Rive Edeka, you can find us here in the region, selling our beautiful bowls with still ingredients from our vertical farms. Also so, by the way, two products we have with Planted, so that's very nice. Um, then, in 2021, we decided, because we had a lot of our stakeholders, partners, clients asking us, I mean, Good Bank, it's all nice and cute, but actually we're interested in the vertical farming system, and we would like to do it like you, and just put it somewhere and grow our own salads, herbs, leafy greens. And then we decided to found really on own hardware company, which is called Farmy, and today I will be speaking a little bit more from this perspective and less from Good Bank, but obviously I'm here with two hats and also super happy to be here and very much looking forward to our conversation. Hi everyone, I'm Tanya, I'm an entrepreneur at heart since over 12 years. I started Lovely Day Foods to help fixing this incredibly broken food system. 
Um, we are makers of perfect, the uh, egg without hen. Why eggs? Because eggs are amazing. They're a wonder of nature. They're actually the world's most popular protein. 1.3 trillion eggs are consumed every year, so eggs are in everything. And yet the environmental costs and also the animal welfare costs have become unbearable. Um, if you haven't tried us yet in one of our 50 outlets across Germany, uh, stop by at our tent. Uh, we are outside here at uh, Green Tech Festival, and I'm super happy to be here. Hello, hi, I'm Christian. I'm from Berlin and Frankfurt-based animal-free cheese company Formo. I hear two main differences. Um, to what I heard from um, the dear co-panelists. We are not a plant-based company. We are a food biotech company. So we use microorganisms, gene edit them, and use them as micro cows, so tiny little protein manufacturers for us. And we use those proteins to then um, make cheese. So we produce that desirable ingredient and make cheese that tastes just like the real thing. So if you've ever had plant-based cheese products or also plant-based egg products, which we also do a replacement for. Uh, you will know that in terms of taste and textures, those fall extremely short, which is one of the main reasons why consumer adoptions is lagging very much um, in, the, in the dairy, in the cheese um, space in particular. So that's the problem we are addressing. Um, we're four years old, 85. Um, FTEs now have our biotech hub in Frankfurt, where the strain engineering, the molecular biology, the fermentation upstream and downstream processes take place. We have in Berlin our food science and product development team. You can visit us in Friedrichshain. It's very far out, Strahlauer Allee, East Berlin, but still, don't we all love a good old e-commute? Um, and yeah, uh, happy to present something that is, I think, different in another respect. We cannot be purchased in Europe yet, so you will not find our product anywhere in any supermarket um, or even in the vegan store of your trust. So um, we can talk a bit about why that is, maybe in a little bit. And um, yeah, looking forward to hopefully lively, maybe even controversial discussion. Let's get out of our let's egg, see, let's egg see. book. Yeah, I'm Alexander Gerfer, CTO of Wirt Electronic. We are electronics components manufacturer. So what does an electronic component manufacturer representative do on the stage of food? Um, so my background is I've grown up on a farm, a traditional farm, which of course over time did go off business because too small. And we had also the topic today of how can we scale up now uh, the food market and the right solutions. So, and we have what we have also in front of us, everybody, is the ever-growing uh, demand of food. In 2050, about 10 billion people, 50% huh? more food demand. That's what the, uh, the challenge is in front of us. And that is um, for all of us, also for traditional farmers or greenhouse farming or vertical farming, controlled environment agriculture. So we presented last year already one portion, of course, um, the LED lights for vertical farming and how they can help to increase the, the plant growth with the right ingredients, vitamin content, whatever, um, to speed up growth and to reduce growth cycles and to, in this vertical farms, of course, save land energy and water, especially water. But on top of this, what we um, addressed this time at the, at the booth also there is about the uh, data, about the well-being of plants, let's say this way, the Internet of Crops, we call it or Internet of Tomato, or Internet of Salad, however you would like to call it, because with precision farming, that's the next very important thing, is how can we grow in the right time, the right quality, the right speed, and with the right plant um, well-being, let's say this way, um, the crops, and that needs data, and the right data transferred into the cloud, the big data to be processed, and that's what we showcase here as solutions in a micro farm, which we can have uh, and discuss over there at the, at the stand at Berlin Partner. So this is what we do. And of course, um, again, an electronic component manufacturer on a stage, why are we here? Yeah, we are not producing as you really the end product, but for us it's important to showcase uh, us here as solution provider. Uh, why? Again, I was a startup at the time being and I uh, failed because of one single component not getting available. Good for me, now I'm here, otherwise I wouldn't have been here if my thing had uh, lifted off. 
Um, and that is what we see for many startups, also how to scale up, how to really go from the first idea to a mass production ready product, scale up product. So we deliver not only like here shown a, an RF module, censoring the right data, make it available, no, also all solution in behind because some details need to be checked like humidity levels and so on, many details that it can work properly best and really um, producing what we need on time. And yeah. I'm CTO of the company, so that's why I'm really technology-wise um, happy to produce and support these ideas. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it becomes apparent already that like behind the actual question of the food that we have on the on the plate um, there's a lot of technology that might be maybe underlying and maybe even more in the future as it as, as we see it with with formal for instance mm -hmm. nevertheless I want to just simply start with the with the food on the plate and 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 the consumer because uh, it turns out that everyone wants to change the food system and Tanya you already explained a little bit your your mission in replacing the hen um, like how far are you on this journey like what is the experience from perfect being around for yeah a couple of months or a couple of years so yeah. like, so the good news is what we really see the market is ready and we are seeing an incredibly pull from the market not only from consumer side but also and particularly from the B2B side. B2B being here food service, B2B being obviously also the industrial applications because if we look at the egg market, 50% is indeed happening on the industrial side here. Um, and this is extremely encouraging. Yeah, So uh, we see that this rather new category is the fastest growing globally. Um, and we have, the, the, the thing is, and I find it interesting that you pointed out this next generation of technology, which is definitely one way to come even closer to uh, the organoleptic characteristics of the real deal of the animal uh, protein. But nevertheless, we can't wait until we have the fermenters being built up, until we have the regulatory approvals everywhere. We have to start making change on the plates now. And for us, the strategy has been very clear. We decided to join forces with partner in missions that are food service outlets that have big pain points when it comes to replacing eggs, when it comes to systematically veganizing their menus. Um, they lack of personnel in the kitchen, so they need also the next generation of convenient solutions. And I see you not, and I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure that you can relate to this kind of challenges. Uh, and of course, this helps players like, like us incredibly, yeah, because um, with them we can start educating the market and educating the consumer and we can systematically lower the hurdle of consumers just trying an animal-free egg, trying an animal-free uh, steak and also show the variety of this first generation of animal-free proteins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you did. Maybe you can you can add on that because planted uh, also deals with hen or with, with chicken in a, in a certain way, uh, replacing the the chicken meat. Um, yeah, what's the, what's the learning from on the consumer side uh, at planted for the past one or two years? Like, can you maybe add your perspective to that? So so for us, very similarly. So we decided basically from day one, we decided to we had to incorporate the company in order to write the first invoice because we had a first customer and we see a big pull from the customer um, towards these products. So I think generally um, when it comes to animal or when it comes to meat, consumers are not seeking to eat a dead piece of an animal. They're looking for something with a certain fibrosity, a juiciness, um, a certain taste, like ways of applying it, like something that fits into their daily life, into their culture. And we just believe that for this, we don't need to slaughter any animals. We can just skip that animals and, and bring the same values of meat directly to the consumers. What's super important in that is the quality of products. So we do, do see a huge variety of product qualities on the market. And some products on the market are definitely not pleasant to eat. So this is why for us, from the beginning on, we said, for us, the product is in the core of what we do. We want to have really high quality, not use any additives and create something which is super delicious and, and healthy. Um, how do you look at, like there's a lot, a lot behind those products, um, maybe also for Good Bank and Farmy because like there's a 
totally different way of production and with planted you're using extruders to to produce the product and it's uh, again different for planted uh, for perfect um, egg alternatives so there's a lot to tell about that but do consumers even care about that or is it just because one point that hasn't been mentioned so far is price parity um, um, will it be adopted just because it's cheaper one day it's like well, like how how do you look at that maybe you Tanya yeah so we we are living in a new reality yeah so the old uh, playbooks of uh, plant based and fast moving consumer good brands 1.0 do no longer reply simply because of the situation the world is currently in um, economic uh, restraints are happening so price parity is of course becoming more and more important from a consumer side and yet what we do still see is that the most important thing is, and you mentioned it as well, is taste. Like, I mean, you can activate first time bias out of curiosity, but once this first element of curiosity is uh, solved, they won't come back if it means the slightest compromise in taste. And then comes convenience, yeah? So um, we, need to, we need to keep in mind that consumer patterns are deeply or I learned over a long, long time. And um, it's challenging enough to educate a consumer that there is actually a variety of choices when it comes to protein sources. We cannot increase the complexity by also making them shift their classical behavior. And this applies for households in the same way as it does for food service partners. So uh, formulations, ways of preparation need to be as close as possible, if not equal, to the animal uh, product. Mm -hmm. um, I want to maybe jump a little bit, and, and because obviously there's, there's a, um, a way to look at it is through the consumer's eyes, and then maybe also um, yeah, starting campaigns and educate maybe uh, young children already about um, uh, about uh, nutrition and and um, climate and the, the role of food uh, for climate change and all that uh, a lot has been uh, talked about that already but um, another perspe perspective would be just simply uh, develop better technologies in the background which consumers not necessarily see and then it, it it's just that you go to the supermarket and buy the cheese that you know for ages and it's just simply produced differently um, with Formo and uh, also maybe to to bring you into the discussion Alexander with um, with word the, the stuff that you do um, maybe you can explain a little bit more like um, the, the, the underlying level of, of, yeah. of change in, in the industry for farmers and, and also let's pick on the quality first because maybe talk about plant-based proteins. Um, the ideal case for me as a producer would be I have the, every time the same quality arriving at my site. So that's what we showcase here is this precision farming. So where we know exactly how to yeah, nutrition the crop at which state of growth and so on. That is what we showcase here that we are able now with the right technology, the right data we produce also and uh, understanding how the plant's well-being is. Um, then we can produce a stable quality on this side. And uh, therefore also with the vertical farming, um, yeah, take out this challenge of ever-changing weather, not clear about droughts, water reduction and so on. So we can really make it in an industrial format, mm -hmm. but not uh, saying that we then override the plants, physiology and so on. So really yeah. delivering a very stable quality product into this uh, supply as a supply chain uh, supplier. That's why we are here to even highlight that again. And we are going further with our customers to develop it even further and better. That's our job, our role. Yeah. And then, of course, yeah, you're right, absolutely. Um, for the consumers, it's important, also, first of all, uh, the stable quality and pharmaceuticals, even based on this, they buy on this already, on this quality of vertical farming. Um, and then, of course, yes, taste equal or better and price same or ever, a bit lower. Yeah? Then it's easier to bring the product in. And that's with the right production of the plant-based proteins and is a very good base that the raw material input for the production side is in the right quality and the right pricing level, so to say that this can lift off and, and take the market, absolutely. 
But it's also a little bit of chicken egg thing, you're right, because price goes down with uh, quantities, uh, with scale, and uh, that's why in the background this continuous innovation needs to needs to take place. But again, we are we we believe like we we don't have the time to hyper engineer um, all this machinery. No, it's um, not hyper engineering. Right? I'm, I'm fully yeah. on you, and that's our daily job because when we start a new product, we are faced with the same story like you. Our price ever time was too high. But with the right sales approach, the right um, support, we are on the same track. And that is right, but someone has to make the first step. And we are willing to go even further. That's why we as an electronic component manufacturer are sitting here, not at home, and say, yeah, the industry will pick it off and will do it by themselves. But absolutely right. And what you do is very good, the tasting outside to really get the taste into the field, right? Yeah. I, um, so just to understand it even better, so like you have um, solutions, um, you, you explained to me like the, the ways you are using LED light um, to optimo optimize the plant growth actually, so, um, and this is yeah quite a novel technology, it's like I didn't hear, hear that before, I didn't yeah, know it's, it, it's but like how do you make sure that there's also a, a certain... Um, perception and, and ad adoption needed uh, within the farming communities uh, so um, they understand that that would actually um, yeah uh, improve their their economics as well so like how, how do you make sure that this um, this is done also we have our own research on this plant physiology ph ah, right word okay also um, biology der pflanze muss das deutsch sagen sorry um, Own research. So we, we deliver together with, uh, with industry institutes and other partners so-called light recipes. By now about 34 crops are already researched, which light at which intensity, which cycles brings my crop to an optimal growth and brings in the right nutrition, the right vitamin content and so on. And that's what we also have our own research here and then make this technology available for people going further and help them to scale up where needed on, on research base. Yeah. Yeah, but it's also quite a quite a tough um, job to convert farmers and, and, and educate them about about the, the possibilities they, that they would as McKinsey have. said most of farmers still lack a bit in behind but we have to show them that with precision farming technology I can be productive I can be more efficient I can be more predictable for me for my output and not when I'm in a free field farming only tomorrow my whole harvest is gone by a flooding or by a storm whatever so no one pays me for this so that's why we are still <laughs> pushing on this the solutions of vertical farming or combined vertical farming with traditional greenhouses to make this more more predictable more productive more efficient mm -hmm. and with the right technologies energy saving in behind water saving in behind land saving in behind we have to convert Acreable land eventually back to forests, right? So that's all coming together, and we need speed here, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we talked about um, um, chicken meat and uh, and also eggs. So um, another uh, another um, important topic is dairy, um, and uh, you already heard from Christian that he has some um, some technology um, in his pocket um, that might change everything in that regard. So maybe you can just um, yeah, explain a little bit uh, more like how, how does it actually work and, and, and actually as your title says you're working on regulatory and, and, um, and all that topic. So like what has to be changed in that regard to, to really make your technology the new norm in the market? Mm, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, dairy, indeed. Um, dairy proteins, specifically. How does the technology work that mostly is referred to right now as precision fermentation, but we're really kind of changing um, that in terms of communication towards fermentation space as one, because you have traditional fermentation technologies, you have biomass fermentation, and then you have three, uh, the third pillar, precision fermentation, which is us and many other companies. What do we do? Essentially, we identify an ingredient that we need for an end product. Um, so that ingredient, in our case, is a certain dairy-like or dairy-identical protein, or at least a protein that performs the same functions as a milk protein, milk containing several proteins, such as casein, um, which is the golden grail, uh, holy grail. So 
once we have identified that protein, we look for a strain um, that will enable us to, in a high, high efficiency, um, express that certain protein. Then you pick basically a microbe, so one a microorganism that can be a fungi, can be a yeast, a bacteria, um, and you insert that genetic information um, that the microorganism needs to express a certain ingredient, a protein, into the microorganism. Then you start fermenting it. So that's basically an ancient technology, right, that we all know from, let's say, beer brewing or bread making or kimchi um, to expand the nutrient profile. And in that certain environment, so picture like a big bioreactor, like a fermentation tank in a brewery, um, the microorganism cold brews for a few days and basically is in that environment becoming extremely productive, productive in terms of producing those desirable um, ingredients, the protein, for us. And we then, um, as a last step, purify, filter filter um, the, the broth and filter out and dry the protein. So what you have essentially is a powder that looks like your workout whey protein powder, pretty much, but it's a different protein that you can do different things with, such as cheese making. So we ship that right now to our food and product development um, teams, and they make cheeses like a camembert-like cheese, um, a gouda-like cheese that are also ripened, a white mold, blue mold cheese, um, a fresh cheese. Uh, so you can do all kinds of things with it, and you can also do an egg replacement with it, and other companies work on other um, end products, such as egg white, for example, in Finland. Um, so endless technical, technological um, potentials, also endless challenges. Um, we talked about uh, yeah the scalability. I think that's a topic in itself. Um, sure, regulatory and policy challenges are also there. Why? Because it's mainly... European law, something called the Novel Food Directive, basically saying ingredients um, and ways of producing food that haven't been consumed widely before the year of 1997 need to undergo a certain um, approval process, which is called the Novel Food Approval Process, which is actually super welcomed by all companies in the, in the ecosystem, including Formo. Why? Because it is the highest level of scrutiny you can get, and once you get that, stamp of approval from the European Food and Safety Authority. Yep. It's basically the gold standard and you can commercialize everywhere. So if you say we have EFSA approval, there's no country in the world that would say, mm -hmm. okay, you're not mm -hmm. launching in our market. Yeah, maybe so like for the listeners to understand, like we're talking a lot about novel food products, um, but there's a certain legal definition of a novel food product um, in the EU, which also like has a lot more boxes to be checked. But still, I want to just come back to the the capacity, like to the scale-up question and the, the capacities that you need, but that might be all true for like all the companies, say a vertical farming uh, company, uh, a plant-based meat company having extruders, um, the, the very special production process for, for the egg yolk at uh, Perfect, and, and also the, bi the bi uh, bioreactors that you need for formal cheeses. Like, um, at least to, to my knowledge, like these production capacities do not really exist today. There might be um, yeah, different uh, usage um, scenarios like a brewery because, as you said, it's also a fermentation process and maybe you can use it differently in the, in the future. But like for all the different products to really reach the mass market, you would need uh, to have more production capacity slash capital expenditure to make it happen, right? Is that, like, how do you look at that maybe from the extrusion perspective in the first place? Yeah, so f from our perspective, we use extrusion technologies and also fermentation technologies, like more um, traditional fermentation, like fungi-based um, fermentation and also bacterial fermentation. And um, we don't see... like building that capacity as a major challenge. So we have decided to build our own production. And of course, we were lucky to get money to buy some steel, which is not usual. So in investors are happy to spend a lot of money on whatever marketing campaigns, but then buying a machine and investing a million in a machine is sometimes a bit critical, but we found the right investors to do so. And we have actually a rather small production um, so we don't need much of much space for our um, extrusion technology. You can all visit our factory. It's actually a glass house, so you can watch how we um, make our meat um, close to Zurich. Um, we have like um, thousand square meters around that, or two thousand square meters, and we produce twenty tons a day. So it's 
already quite a bit and multiplying that is not a huge thing. On top of that, like the technologies that we're developing, we develop them in a way that we can basically plug them into existing value chains. So if you think about the meat value chain, you, we, you basically start with plant protein as well. We can just take that plant protein directly. Then we skip the animal farming and the slaughtering. So these facilities we will not be able to use in the future, but maybe some of you, let's see. And then we move basically into the meat processing and the capabilities which are there in meat processing, um, like these machines can be partly used one-to-one -to, -one to process plant-based meats. So these capacities are existing. We are in contact with many um, meat manufacturers as well. They're all interested in like filling their capacities in the future, super interested in that. They have a lot of know-how because there's so much technology and know-how in um, animal meat processing. And they have, I mean, they have almost no margins on their products. So there is really like a momentum that these companies are ready to switch and move towards a more sustainable food system. Is that true for precision fermentation as well, or is it more complicated? It's more complicated. So um, for us, it's interesting that you say that. So being a venture case, having to operate extremely capital expenditure light, it's not really an option to build own facilities, um, own scale-up industrial-sized facilities is what I mean. We have own pilot plants, pilot facilities. We have a 200-liter um, bioreactor. Um, we have an own food plant with which we can produce about 50 kilos of cheese a day, but that's no industrial scale. And um, frankly, as a company, on the one hand, we cannot allocate that capital um, to building industrial infrastructure. It takes too much time, if we, even if we had the expertise. Um, and we don't have the expertise, so that's not what we are specializing on. So we spend capital on research and development, uh, on innovation, and not on building industrial structures. So from our point of view, that is the job of uh, large corporates who can serve as CMOs. So we do explicitly and only work together with CMOs when it comes to producing on an industrial scale. And that is also the job of governments. So uh, public funding needs to massively flow into building industrial-sized bioreactor um, infrastructures. And you know, I compared with, um, let's say, hydrogen infrastructure or also electric vehicle charging infrastructure. You know, none of that has been in place. And still, innovators came out and said, we have to start somewhere. And at some point, governments and corporates jumped on it and said, yeah, you guys you're right, um, you know, this is the future, we have to double down on that also in terms of spending. Um, it'll take time, it'll take a lot of resources, that's not the job of the innovators from our point of view, but um, yeah, mm -hmm. we, we bet and hope that others will jump in there. Yeah, like not only the, the, the expenditure of, of capital, but also like the incentives around the whole process, process of building these capacities. Um, do you feel like Anybody of you, do you feel that is captured already enough in the in the public discourse? Like we're talking a lot about energy transformation and, and a lot of different topics, but that we would need totally different infrastructure for food production in the future. Do you feel that is already um, yeah enough captured in the in the media, for instance? So I don't think so at all. I think yeah. it's one of the things that us that neither the startups and companies like to talk yeah. about. A lot. Why? Because it makes um, your story storytelling, especially when you fundraise, difficult. It's basically two things that you have to address: massive challenges, um, the scaling up, the lack of industrial infrastructure, and the regulatory uh, challenges. So, um, personally, I think we have to talk about it much more. Um, there's no added benefit. Everyone understands anyway when you do DD um, that you have to overcome these challenges. So I think also broader media, yeah, they like to write about how hyped any given industry is in any given moment. And that certainly applies to a lot of food tech right now. Um, but without addressing collectively uh, these critical questions as well and facing those, I don't think we're going to succeed long term. So actually, you know, we have to be honest and frank about it and mm -hmm. come together. Yeah, this is also a topic that resonates a lot with me. And it also makes me personally quite angry because um, when I look at global scale, 
Yet again, Europe is falling behind. Yeah, I mean, if we look left and right, what's happening in Asia, what's happening in Israel, what's of course happening in the US, where there is like systematic build up of uh, innovative capacities, uh, where this this next generation of food being formed um, and. Here in Europe, we are again still talking about um, what do we define as food. And don't get me wrong, I think it's, uh, it's great to have very high standards uh, in, in, in what is food and what not. Um, but I see that we really got to speed up because otherwise it will happen to us again with this wave, next wave of food, what has been happening uh, in the tech space that will be falling totally, uh, totally short. And yet, I have to say, there's also some uh, light at the end of the tunnel, but uh, like the uh, Berlin Food Campus, which is a privately uh, funded project um, that's bringing together all system uh, players of the ecosystem, um, where there will be facilities um, that can be also rented at scale, small scale, larger scale, by startups, by corporates, etc. So it's helping. Nevertheless, it's taking it's taking time and it's taking capital. And I really see that startups, like you mentioned at Christian, need to join forces. We need to continue joining forces here to constantly educate and uh, also lobby yeah, for this cause. Mm -hmm. Also, for the, for the support of these ideas, it's important to eventually more cooperate, not with large entities only. It's a German Mittelstand, I would say, which is a bit more flexible on this. Hmm. We are not so related on uh, shareholder value things. Uh, if I'm not so fast in a, in a yeah, profitable state, uh, we can wait longer. That's what we did uh, in Würth a long time with many of our investments. So Mittelstand is a very good base to, to work on. And again, we as Mittelstand, when I look into another startup, we had the uh, harvesting robot Barry, a startup which is having a uh, harvest robot, which has or solve the issue of how, how can I find labor now for harvesting things? And I can do it hopefully 24-7. No, you cannot. If people are not willing to work 24-7, so they had an optical problem, we solved the optical problem. We could make things comparable now by the optics inspection, which they could not do by themselves. So we as Mittelstand supported them to get this yeah, robot working, and now they can go and, and scale up, right, and bring it into the market. And we have to raise the awareness about all these new solutions and why they are good. And what we do in Würth is every time we don't accept a no. Yeah. So we try to build the no's into a yes. But we have to ask many questions. Why do you say no in the regulatory body? Why do you say no for a plant grown without soil is not bio-label ready? No pesticides in, water saving, energy saving. We say it's not biodegradable uh, plant. It's super crazy, let's say, mm. this way. So yes, you're right. We have to have the yeah. raise of awareness why this food is good. Yeah. What is the, gu the good yeah. thing for us as a like, community? But, but as, you, as you're explaining it, it's more or less a, like a grassroots camp yeah, revolution. <laughs> campaign. Yeah. Yeah. You wanted to yeah. add on that as well. Yeah. Yeah, I just basically wanted to add um, to what they said before. So I think in order to, like we managed to receive funding in order to build our own capacity. And I think it is important that we use existing capacities, but um, basically in order to get money for whatever we need to build up newly, it's important that there is a real business case behind. And I think if you have that, then you also receive money in order to build that. So if you think about what you've heard in the press, like Beyond Meat now, for example, Meatless Farm, they had super low product margins because they didn't produce themselves. They just bought it from somewhere else and they were just bound to whatever they had to pay to their suppliers. And being able to produce yourself actually allows you to make, um, like generate eventually profits on food. So you earn money in food with producing food. Mm -hmm. And um, like, what's the difficult part in here is that you manage to make new technologies that are actually scalable and that eventually can be at a certain scale um, and with certain machines actually um, be able to produce um, affordable foods. Foods need to be produced at, uh, produced at masses and affordably. That's, that's what it's all about. Yeah, I would just like to wrap a little bit up about the topic of vertical farming, which we had when we started it. So just for you guys to have an understanding what Farmy does. So it's basically a hardware company. And any restaurant, hotel, it's not for homes that we don't like, but basically business organization could put a farm shelf and grow their own 
greens, let's put it like this. So what we saw as a problem is that we had so many requests without even having the company because there was nobody able to ship that thing. So you had startups and they had either very difficult, let's put it, technology um, parts that basically the, uh, the organization or businesses couldn't work with and they were unable to start even to grow their own food. Yeah, so what we did and what I think is very interesting in this round is we don't have any external capital at um, Farmy. So what we did is we collected a couple of orders and worked with small and mittelständische Unternehmen in Germany, also for lights, we had our first lights from Austria. So we really tried to collect what there is existing and build an easy solution that people even can start or organizations can start because there is really such a need in the market. And also we see it with Planted, for example. We tried so many meat-free options and we didn't like it and it was the taste. And that's how the things work. And the thing is just that also sometimes one needs to start a little bit pragmatic. It's not always the huge capital one needs. And I'm fully with you that the own production gives you even the sustainable growth you can have as a company. But there are ways Ways, if one thinks a little bit, let's put it old school, how you can also found a technical company, a hardware company, a food company that relies on specific, let's put it, machinery in other ways. Yeah, there are also a lot of banks that are very supportive in that regards. I hope that we, like, unfortunately, the time is already up for our panel. I hope that we do not end up this thing with, like, everyone complaining about the political bodies. And I, I think that we managed. Um, it is part of the discussion for sure and especially addressing the, the big technology questions um, uh, it won't work out with, without the politics and the governmental bodies uh, in Germany and the EU and maybe elsewhere in the world uh, but uh, in the end we also heard a bit of, of, of a campaign for pragmatism and, and building good business cases and, and building like superior products in the end that tick all the boxes not only the sustainability but also taste, nutrition and all these things and maybe also the, the German Mittelstand uh, to be involved in all that and um, in a very pragmatic way um, building new solutions that, that optimize uh, the food value chain. Right? Eventually, we may add something on this discussion about how to bring a product into the market because we do this since many years. I'm the oldest eventually here on the stage. So one thing is really important, the thing of um, from seed to plate, we call it in our case, the pricing of seed to plate is the food price we pay today, the real food price. And against this pricing level or system I have to fight as a startup as well, right? So when we see now the milk price has dropped, right? For why? Not because the farmer did want this. It was a big chains doing that again now. So this is what I have to fight. And for us, when we talk to, to startups, it's very important in our discussion to startups, hardware startups, we love hardware startups, right? It's about please make scenarios. Make clear scenarios about when your price drops 10%, 20%, 30%, it is still profitable or how you have to scale it up that you are still profitable. Because at a certain time, a certain day, energy cost rises up. So why does, does industry get um, price support on energy? And we don't, right? So this is not fair. So again, this is really how important is food for us, as in, uh, yeah, for us all, and why don't we give the right support into this, and even for new technologies here, which do it for a good reason to save the planet. So that's really the thing. Also, but in behind, as a as an product or fa factory owner, we have to do scenarios in costing to be clear, where's my critical point, yeah, and where from which state on, which scale size of my company, I grow with profit, because that's also in behind. We have to make profit as a company to make the next developments, the next investments, the next growth. Mm -hmm. Really nice closing words. I, uh, I thank everyone to, to be on stage with me here today and talk uh, about food tech and, and also to you uh, listening to us and uh, wish you all a nice afternoon here at Green Tech Festival. Thank you. Thank you very much.